the hearing will now reconvene. Um, I'd now like to recognize the ranking member, uh, my friend and colleague, Congressman McKeon. Five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Fellner, uh, your testimony suggests that comparing workers' compensation claims to OSHA recordable <coughs> injuries is an inappropriate comparison. I think we were discussing that, talking a little bit about that, and I think you didn't get a chance to uh, fully explain that. Can you elaborate on that? Thank you, uh, Congressman Dean. I'd be delighted to do so. Uh, the, the cliche I used before was it's like counting apples and oranges. Um, let me be a little bit more specific in that regard. Uh, workers, any attempt to compare a single OSHA record keeping regulation, no matter how complex, with worker compensation regimes begins with the following problem. There is no single workers' compensation regime. There are 50 of them. And each one is distinct unto itself insofar as to how it categorizes and compensates for various injuries and illnesses. Two, with respect to the universe of employees that are subject to OSHA jurisdiction and record keeping, once again, it's apples and oranges. Workers' compensation, by and large, includes self-employed, uh, individuals. It includes uh, federal, state, and local individuals. Uh, it, it includes a variety of other individuals that are not subject to OSHA jurisdiction, the 10 employee or less exception uh, to OSHA jurisdiction immediately comes to mind. So the universe that is looked at when you look at workers' compensation injuries and illnesses is a much broader, a much more expanded universe uh, than is uh, involved in OSHA record keeping. Number three, the definition of what constitutes an injury on the one hand, and number two, whether it is workplace related on the other hand, could not be more different in the workers' compensation, in the 50 workers' compensation context, than exists in OSHA. OSHA has its own definitional framework. The 50 regimes have their definitional frameworks. So to suggest that one can simply look at a workers' compensation list of injuries and illnesses and transpose them to OSHA record keeping and say, therefore, there's something deliberately going on, as is suggested by uh, the title of this hearing, something deliberately going on to cook the OSHA books is a misconception that I would like to dispel. Thank you very much. You know, I, I listened uh, carefully to uh, all of your testimony, and it I think you all have very sincere, you're all coming at this different directions, but very sincerely. But it looked to me like the story again of the elephant with the three blind men trying to describe it. Uh, one person touches the side of the elephant and says an elephant's a wall. Somebody grabs the leg and says it's a, like a large tree trunk and somebody grabs the tail and says it's a rope. I mean, you've all heard the story and, and that's what I, uh, what I gather here, uh, Mr. Whitmore, your, your testimony says this happened under Democrat and Republican regimes, the, the problems that you have with this. It's not a, a partisan thing, although, you know, probably the, the fact that we're doing it now uh, with the Democratic Congress and Republican administration kind of, you know, tends to think, well, it's, it's all a Republican problem that we're going to expose. I, 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 I'm, I'm glad we're having the hearing because I, as I, I come from a, a small business background, and I'm, I'm starting to think, you know, did we report all of our injuries? Do we know of all of our injuries? Uh, we didn't have some of uh, ours was retail business, so we didn't have some of the uh, problems that Mr. Span uh, talked about, you know, where you have warehousing. We didn't, we didn't have that, that kind of a, a situation with big equipment and that kind of stuff. But I, I, I'm, 
I, I, I can see problems. I don't know exactly answers. And I think we're going to come up with a lot more questions today than, than answers. But I, uh, again, appreciate you all being here. And, and, uh, and, and I, I'm, I know as we get all of your full testimonies in the record and go through the questions we have here today, it probably would lead to we should have more hearings to find out more of what's, of what's going on. And uh, my time's expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm glad we're having this hearing today. Um, about 15 years ago, I worked on a report with an organization called the Public Justice Center in Maryland, and we entitled it, it was a, it was a look at the poultry industry in particular, and we, we called it, the name of the report was the Disposable Workforce, because what we found was a lot of evidence of some of the issues that have been described in the Charlotte Observer Series. But in particular, what was happening is if you got hurt, you were gone. And that's why the workforce was disposable. They didn't have access to care if they got hurt. Um, and the employers in those instances were taking advantage of the demand for the work um, to basically sideline people if they, if they suffered an injury. So I'm very, I'm, I'm very keen on the discussion that we're having today. Um, but I'm very focused as well on what we can do about it in terms of raising the vigilance within OSHA. Um, and one of the questions I had is a, a few of you have alluded to the fact that there are there's sort of bonuses and incentives out there that reward, I mean, you know, in addition to sort of the general reputation of a company for having a low, um, a low injury report that inside the company there are incentives and bonuses for, for medical people and others, human resources, whatever it is, uh, if, the, if that count is low. And I wondered if anyone would speak to, maybe we can talk, start with Dr. Roseman, speak to the, the question of whether that's just a practice that ought to be banned or prohibited or, or curbed in some way and what the potential to do that is. Um, I think, there certainly are practices out there, as you describe, um, that discourage uh, workers from coming forward. And some are incentives, and, and some, you know, are sort of almost punishment if they do. Um, the point I was trying to make is we need to go beyond an employer-based system, which would in some way minimize um, whatever incentives or disincentives. And we, we have all these additional databases out there and I think it's very important, uh, the point I, I try to make in terms of acute traumatic work-related fatalities, where the system has gone beyond employer base. And I think it's, it's very important. I mean, one could, uh, by law, uh, you know, not allow maybe some of these incentives, but I, I don't think that's really the total answer. I think it's going beyond an employer-based system. Do you think there's enough, sorry, do you think there's enough information out there and data that we could eliminate the undercount problem? I mean, is that possible to do? Well, we have to remember that the whole system for non-fatal injuries and illnesses is based on a statistical sampling and an extrapolation. And I think, yes, we're smart enough to use other data systems to do the extrapolation, do a better extrapolation, do a better statistical sampling. So the answer is yes. I think going beyond employer base, not eliminating the employer reporting, but using all these other data systems, we could do a much better job at extrapolating the true numbers that are of injuries and illnesses in the United States. Thank you. Did you want to respond? No, I'd just like to point out that uh, CSTE, which stands for the Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologists, have actually been looking at this issue for some period of time and uh, have in a, uh, a number of states now an ongoing project which uses a suite of 19 different occupational health indicators, uh, really for the purpose of trying to take a better look at the whole elephant, recognizing that each one of these databases looks at only the arm or the, the, the trunk or, or whatever, to use your analogy, sir. Uh, and so I, I think that there certainly are a number of databases that uh, could be linked that could uh, improve the situation. However, I will also say that there are no databases yet 
that really help us very much with the uh, chronic occupational disease right. issues and the exposure issues that cause uh, latent diseases. And that needs uh, further thought, uh, deep thought, about how to address that issue. Great. Uh, Mr. Whitmore, first of all, I want to thank you for your testimony today. It's not easy to do what you've done. I want to acknowledge that, you're a, that you reside in my district, and I'm very proud of that. Um, you had mentioned at the end of your testimony uh, and, and Chairman Miller cited this as well, statistics on you know, a steel plant that has zero reported injuries and so forth. Um, what is the system, and I guess we heard a little bit about it, but what's the system inside um, OSHA that would, that would, where that would pop up on a radar screen and trigger um, an investigation or somebody to go out and check the situation? In other words, how do we allocate the resources of OSHA across the different uh, workplaces that we look at. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sarbanes. I appreciate your comments. Um, bottom line is this, okay, OSHA inspects when there's a fatality, when there's a complaint, or if there's a planned inspection, a targeted inspection. I think the one recently announced for this coming year has like around 4,000 establishments with high loss time rates. No one's looking below five. No one's looking at that. I looked at it and said, you know, guys, we can't go on like this. There aren't ma and pa steel mills out there. These are large establishments, large employers. We need to go after them. Mr. Fellner talks about the SST. I, I, I welcome the opportunity, hopefully at some point today, to talk a little bit about his numbers. Because in one instance, he said in 2005, I believe it was, there was 100 audits done. 100. We had put in for 400 in the primary list. OK, they only did 100. Is that going to tell you everything you know to need to know about low employer reporting? I don't think so. I am not the dot PhD statistician, never wanted to be, never will be. I know that these low rates are bogus. I have looked at them over my, over my career, and they, they basically shut me down in 1992. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have really only one question, and uh, that's to Mr. Whitmore, if I could. Um, Osher and Mr. Fellner indicate that the audits are being conducted that ensure accuracy of employer reports. Uh, you seem to feel otherwise. Would you tell us why uh, those re audits, in your estimate, are not adequate? Well, we have to be a little careful here because the word audit is thrown around a lot, and, and I know it's hard for you guys. It's hard for me, and I have to deal with this stuff on a, on a fairly regular basis. There's a separate program that does records audit checks, okay? Just to give you an idea, um, in 2006, the last one I believe that was done, there were 24 employers in that sample that had more than 250 employees. I don't think we can say a whole heck of a lot for all employers above 250 employees based on a sample of 24. Okay, and the audits are done. The critical thing you have to understand that when our auditors in this audit program go in, they say, I want to see certain folders on certain people, like Representative Hare. I want to see your medical records. Who do you think gets them for him? The employer. Who do you think hands him the folder? The employer. You're totally dependent because they don't follow up with a medical access order to go to the hospitals, the clinics that are used, to check. That's where we get our big cases. Not every employer is, you know, is dumb enough to have the, the goods right there and hand them over to you. But there are cases where that happens. And, and don't get me wrong, there are a lot of really good big employers around, okay? You know, everybody says, I think 90% are doing the right thing. And my response has been throughout my career, give me the 10. You take care of the 90 that are doing a great job. Give me the 10 that don't care about their employees and don't care about what OSHA does or stands for. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. 
Chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, uh, Mr. Kildee. I uh, first apologize. I had another hearing uh, this morning on Resources Committee, but I read uh, your testimony. I appreciate uh, your testimony. Uh, I can just recall things years ago. I'm 78 years old. I can recall my dad worked in the plant and uh, how things were then. They've come a long way since then, but there's there's human nature, there's a good side of human nature, and there's the bad side of human nature. And at times we have to make sure the law protects people from the bad side of human nature. And uh, I can recall my dad almost being killed in the plant by being pulled into his machine, Couldn't had no capacity to turn his own machine off. Those, those were, that was a long time ago, that was in the 30s. But human nature remains the same, and, and law protects people against uh, the shortcomings of employers, and, and uh, if it is a 10%, that's the 10% we want to make sure the law uh, watches and protects their employees from, and I uh, very much appreciate uh, the testimony this morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Spann, I apologize. I came in uh, late this morning when you were, when, and I missed your testimony. I, I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about your injury and the effects, uh, you know, and any repercussions you had from reporting <laughs> the injury and, you know, the effect of these incentive games that they're playing in terms of being able to. Well, thank you. And I'd like to say that I was hurt doing my job at the Bash's Warehouse with my supervisor standing next to me that we were unloading a tractor trailer and I got some debris in my eyes, which they did not have any safety glasses or anything like that wasn't given to me. And I went home and the next day <clears throat> I had an infection. So I went to the emergency room after calling my doctor by me being a diabetic, I have to be real careful. And uh, I contacted my supervisor at the warehouse and explained to him what happened. Uh, the plant manager explained to him what happened and what situation I was in and the doctor gave me some days off work because of an infection I had in my eye. And he then immediately told me to bring in the documentation and he'll take care of it. So after returning back to work with the doc, my doctor's documentation stating that he kept me off from work for a few days and the reason why uh, he did take the papers and he also punished me by giving me points stating that I shouldn't have called in, uh, called, called in from work you know, to report that I would be off. And uh, I did question him and ask him what was the reason why would I be punished by giving points when I got hurt on your job. And he tried to deny that it ever happened but my supervisor explained to him that he was standing there when the incident did take a care. And uh, from that point, I don't know what happened, but I checked the OSHA 200 log, and it's not even mentioned in there. But I do have the uh, documentation from my doctor that it occurred, you know. And, it's, and uh, this goes on to say that, that the company that I was employed with, they, uh, I don't know what's going on with, with the documentation as far as getting them on the OSHA log, but I was just listening to the guy here to my left stating that the facts and figures for the uh, OSHA papers are right, and I'm just, you know, from, <coughs> I, I'm a worker. I know from experience, not from what I'm told and what I'm reading, you know, that I've witnessed that uh, millions of accidents and stuff that's happening in the workplace, and people are afraid to report them because they don't want their, their uh, wages cut or being punished by the employer. During your testimony, which I missed, you said that, um, and I want to make sure I heard you right, did you, you received 10 minutes of training to drive a forklift? Yes. I uh, what, what would you say is the average time for a person to become reasonably proficient to and, and, and have it safe to drive the forklift? Well, basically, it can take people up to six to seven months with a pr to be properly trained. To and you get 10 minutes? Pardon? And you get 10 minutes? Yes. At Bash's Corporation, I was only given 10 minutes to drive a pallet jack. And I need to remind you that these, that the equipment that I had to use to perform my job, I would have to be on heavy equipment all through the eight-hour shift. 
as well as the people who's being hired who don't even have a driving license <laughs> to operate these equipment. That's why if you look at the OSHA report that uh, bashes a corporation, the warehouse itself, it explains more than they got the average of injury rates anywhere in the United States. And these are the ones that's being recorded. Think about the ones that's not being recorded. Well, let me ask you if I could, Mr. Fellner, something that, that's troubling to me. Dr. Rosen, as I understand it, Rosen did a study in 2003 that showed that there were 693 amputations in the state of Michigan in 1997 whereas the uh, BLS survey estimated only 440 amputations occurred. Uh, you can argue that the ergonomic issues are hard for employees to diagnose and, and that their record keeping regulations are complicated, but it would seem to me that amputations aren't too hard for employers to be able to diagnose. And yet, with the BLS only estimated 64 percent of the true number of amputations in Michigan in 1997, so how can you say there's no evidence of, of significant underreporting when you see numbers like this? I have not had a chance to review Dr. Rosenman's study, but to the extent that that study relies in whole or in part on workers' compensation data, to the extent that it does, then my prior response to Congressman McKeon would apply, and that is the extent to which that 680 includes individuals not subject to OSHA's jurisdiction, uh, then we are indeed talking about apples and oranges. Uh, appropriate numbers of amputations were recorded under OSHA logs, uh, and appropriate workers' compensation amputations occurred uh, pursuant to his examination. Well, just one final comment. We may be talking about apples and oranges, but we're talking about people who've lost limbs, too. And I think that when we have an underreporting of 60 percent, um, you know, whoever is responsible for not getting the numbers correctly, um, it can be apples and oranges, it can be apples and anything, but the fact of the matter remains, these are, these are people, these are workers who have been harmed, uh, severely harmed. And I do not mean to denigrate uh, any amputation, God forbid, for one second. The question is whether those workers were subject to OSHA's jurisdiction, and I would have to look much more closely at his study in order to make that determination and respond to your question. Okay. The, uh, the, uh, my time's up. I'll, I'll come back to you, Dr. Rosman, because I know you wanted to comment on this. The chair would now recognize the gentlelady from uh, California, Ms. Woolsey, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I am so sorry that I've missed most of the questions. So I'm going to ask a question that I think you all can answer for me. Um, well, I have two points. The first point is the answer to your question probably has to do with who you, who's hired you to work for them on this, which I find quite disturbing. But um, when we're doing such a poor job, I believe, in collecting uh, the real data on workforce injuries, and when uh, we have a hard time reporting uh, severed limbs, amputations, how in the world do we report health, which isn't obvious, and uh, near misses? I mean, because as far I was a human resources uh, professional for 20 years, and that was back at the beginning when we had Cal OSHA. And actually, near misses made the difference quite often uh, of whether a person would later on lose an eye because we learned from an experience that, uh, or another. So um, I don't know wh who to ask. I, I actually thought I was going to ask uh, Dr. McClellan that question and then any of the rest of you. Uh, thank you for the question because it's a question of uh, significant concern to our members. Uh, and uh, most of our members, uh, when asked by an employer, employer uh, to advise them as to how to take uh, good measure of how the employer is doing with respect to health and safety, would advise them to look beyond simply the OSHA log and very much to include first aid reports as well as, as you point out, near misses. The difference between a few millimeter scratch on the skin, which requires a Band-Aid and might be considered a uh, first aid or, or a near miss, 
and a significant laceration, perhaps severe enough to cause an amputation, is luck, not safety. Right. And so the point here is that uh, the OSHA log itself will not give a true look for the purpose for really which we have it, and which is to prevent work-related injuries and illnesses. Uh, it, it, the, OSHA, the OSHA log, even at its best, is only going to be a lagging indicator, and uh, it's a body count. Uh, we would really like to be able to use a suite of indicators that take a look at uh, the bottom of the iceberg in order to prevent anyone from getting on the OSHA log for the real reason, because it's safe. Well, Mr. Spann, uh, if uh, an employer had an appropriate uh, committee, safety committee, wouldn't, would near misses a report on, with internally uh, of near misses be a, a good indicator to the committee of what needed to be uh, uh, concentrated on? Yes, yes, it could be true in some factors. It depends on actually where you're working at because of the fact that safety committee can, can basically people who are inside the warehouse or on the side of the job can actually determine what need to be changed and what steps they may take to make the place even safer. The work, the, you know, to go to work, you know, it's sad that you have to go to work and look around you scared on what's going to happen or what limb is going to be cut off today. <laughs> uh, and just to add on a little bit to this, it's sad that most, the reason why a lot of this stuff is not being reported because of these companies with their private doctors that they send you to, and these doctors will actually, no matter from what my experience in seeing, that you can have your feet broken, toes broken, they send you back to work the next day. And then I believe this is the reason why a lot of this is not getting reported. Well, would you mind going back the next day if you weren't lo losing salary? I mean, me, me, light duty? Me personally, I, I wouldn't go back to your job. You can basically keep it. Like I said, I'm a diabetic and my health and my, my health No, I, well, I mean, hurt. it would depend on the situation. But well, when it's ready to, it, when a, a work injured worker is ready to go back to work or uh, a worker in poor health is ready to come back to work, if they were put back on light duty and with full pay, would, right. would there be a, any quite, uh, objection to that? I'm quite sure a lot of people would go back to work if they're going to get their full pay yeah. and to be able to support their family and pursue the American dream like we all are. We have, we're here to support our families. Right. And, you know, the price of gas today, who can afford to take off work? Well, that's true, too. Uh, yes, Mr. Whitmore. Yes, Ms. Wilsey, thank you very much. Uh, real quickly, um, near misses, the really good companies out there, they're collecting information on near misses already, okay, because they understand what you're saying. I think you're right about a safety and health program, a good one should have that. This right here is a picture from the Charlotte Observer of a gentleman's ankle with one, two, three, four, five screws in it. This wasn't a near miss. It was a real hit and didn't get recorded. It was an oversight by the employer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Spann, uh, can you tell us a little more about the effect of company raffles or other incentive programs in your workplace, do they encourage uh, workers to be more safe or do they encourage workers to, to perhaps hide their injuries? Per personally, I believe it's uh, a incentive and a raffle, the reason why the company is doing it, to keep people quiet because of the fact if, you know, with the policy that they have at the company that I was employed with, it's, you know, it's totally unheard of and they use this tactic to keep the people mouth closed, okay, well, we're going to win an MP3 player or a trip to Hawaii for a week or stuff in this nature that, you know, this is what they offer them. You know, if you do not have any injuries in your department, so most of the people would love to take their wife on a cruise to, uh, to California, to Great America, or whatever the case may be. So I believe it's something that they're using to keep people quiet from reporting these injuries. Mr. McClellan, could you comment on that? 
Uh, yes, I concur. Uh, our, our members, uh, we've uh, been collecting uh, anecdotes and, um, uh, for example, one of our uh, senior physicians reported a, a case in which a employee came to his uh, clinic uh, with a very fresh uh, laceration, obviously had just occurred, requiring sutures. And he asked the, um, uh, he, he asked the uh, physician to consider this as not work-related, that to pretend that it had occurred the night before, because to consider it work-related would um, mean that his entire team would miss out on an opportunity for a steak dinner. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I just um, wanted to follow up. I know, uh, Dr. Roseman, you, you had something that you wanted to say, and then, and then I maybe have one question for you. Uh, thank you. Yes, well, the study that was asked about was we reviewed emergency department data. And um, so it was, there was worker compensation data, but we also looked at emergency. I, I think it's important, this issue, whether it's within the scope for OSHA, I mean, as a healthcare provider, I'm interested in amputations, and I'm interested in preventing amputations. And I think it's too narrow to say, oh, well, uh, OSHA may not cover this. Um, I, I think we need to think about work-related injuries and illnesses, and how are we going to prevent them in the United States? Um, and and I, I, one other point I'd like to make is, you know, there have been, it's true, this, the, the issue that Mr. Fellner has raised about workers' comp, well, maybe that's a different fruit, but, um, you know, in seven states, this has now been looked at, and, they're, and in seven states, they're not being counted um, in the current uh, annual survey. Um, and, in all, and, and in these studies, these people all had at least three lost work days. So these were people in the workers' comp system. In Michigan, it was seven days away from work in some of the states, because each state does vary. But in all seven states, people with at least three days away from work were not being counted uh, in our current statistics. And to me, I, that's not apples and oranges. Those people were off work because of a work-related injury and illness, and they were not being counted. Mm -hmm. Mr. Whitmore, you, you had something you wanted to add? Thank you, Representative Hare. Appreciate it. A couple quick things. Um, as much as I appreciate Dr. Roseman's you know, testimony, uh, the mission of the Department of Labor is to take care of American workers. The mission of OSHA is to take care of American workers. I'm, I'm very appreciative of his work. I want my agency to do its job effectively, honestly, and openly. I want to show you this from the Charlotte Observer series. This is their safety program. It's a t-shirt, and it says, Strut McClucker, Columbia Farm Safety Mascot. I guess when I get fired, I can put in for this job. Two million safe hours without a lost time accident. That's what you get. That's what you get when you work there as well as all these other things I have here. That's their program. If OSHA can't or won't do its job, it's up to you all to make it do the job that we're paid by for the, from the American people to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Well, let me uh, thank all the panel for coming. I just wanted to, in closing, just say something here. It seems to me Mr. Whitmore brought up a great point. We have. You know, if 90 percent of the employers are doing the right thing and reporting this, um, our job is to, to make sure that those, that those people who work in with the 10 percent who aren't, uh, I'm thoroughly convinced there's underreporting going on. Um, the the, the T-shirt, you know, maybe <laughs> Mr. Spano is just thinking of the T-shirt. You could wear that to Adventureland or something. You know, it's just incredible to me that um, we have accidents occurring and yet we just we don't report it. The pictures, I, I think, speak. Um, much more louder than, than probably anybody could. I will tell you that um, Chairman Miller is a great chairman, and, and we, you know, this, this is a great hearing, and I have the, the honor of being able to, to, to chair the last part of it. It's been my first chance to sit in this chair, but um, um, he, th <laughs> I, uh, thank you. But he did bring up a good thing. I think, too, one last thing. I think it's important that we just don't talk to the employers when we go in to find out what's going on in that factory or that, that plant. We got to talk to the workers. They do the work every single day. 
<coughs> excuse me, they're the ones getting hurt. They're the ones that have seen their coworkers getting hurt. If we just really only talk to the employer, we will never really, as, as the chairman said, ever get a real picture of what is actually going on there. And I hope um, and someday we, we will get to where workers actually have the very same rights and the opportunity to, to um, uh, be able to stay safe. Uh, let me just remind the members we'll have 14 days to submit additional materials for the hearing record. I thank all of you uh, for taking time out of I know busy schedules to be here. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. Good job, Mr.